Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries, where we take a dive into some of the world's most prolific crimes. If this is your first time to the channel, hello and welcome, and thank you for being here. Today, we are discussing a cold case that had been without leads for 17 years. Let's get into it. February 24th, 1986. Sherry Rasmussen was living a seemingly perfect life. She was young, newly married to the man of her dreams, and had done very well in her career in nursing. She had a strong network of close friends and family, and friends who would describe Sherry as a bright light for those around her, always laughing, and she would light up any room she walked into. That morning, she decided to take a sick day and told her husband she wasn't going to be going into work that day. She had a presentation to deliver at work, and she wasn't keen on the subject matter, so she was going to use a back injury caused by aerobics the previous day. Her husband John kissed her goodbye and promised not to be home too late and left for work. That day, in the early evening hours, John came home. He had tried to call Sherry all day to check in on her, both at home and at work, but he couldn't get in touch. None of her co-workers or close friends had seen her that day. This didn't initially cause him alarm. He had just assumed that she had perhaps gone out and not told him, or maybe gone into the office at work and no one had seen her yet. What was unusual was the answering machine at home hadn't been turned on. Sherry had always been on his case asking him to turn on the answering machine when he left the house, so he was surprised she hadn't turned it on. He arrived home and saw that there was glass in the driveway from a broken patio door, and Sherry's car was missing. He assumed Sherry had backed into something with the car, and it fell and broke the window, and he was initially annoyed. Then he started to notice more out-of-place things. The door that entered the home from the garage was slightly open, and the living room was a disaster with furniture thrown all over the place and broken glass and a bloody handprint next to the panic button to their home alarm system. It's at this moment when John finds his new bride lying motionless on the floor, still in her nightgown that she had been wearing when he left. Her face had been beaten so badly she was almost unrecognizable and when he touched her, her body was stone cold. Sherry Rasmussen had been gone for hours. A completely distraught John calls 911, and when the operator was trying to ascertain the situation, John was unable to speak. Police arrived on the scene and noted that it looked like Sherry had fought until her last breath, and that her husband was in complete shock. John tells police he last saw his wife when he left for work that morning, and the police begin the investigation. Sherry was a very intelligent woman. From 16, she went straight into college and discovered her love for nursing. By her late 20s, she had worked through the ranks to be a nursing instructor, teaching nursing students. It was at a college party that she met John, a mechanical engineering student. He quickly moved into her condo and the two became husband and wife in November of 1985. But they hadn't been together very long when odd things began happening in their relationship. After their engagement party, a woman showed up at their home. She had been wearing revealing workout attire and was holding skis and had asked to speak to John. John explained to Sherry that the woman had been an ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Lazarus that the two were still friends and that he had promised Stephanie he would wax her skis. Sherry was furious and told John that she didn't want him to have any contact with Stephanie, but D John told her she was being ridiculous and to stop being jealous. When Lazarus came back a few days later to pick up the freshly waxed skis, she showed up in a full police uniform, complete with a gun. Sherry was unnerved to find out Lazarus was a police officer. Lazarus had also stopped by her work and informed Sherry that John had come to her after their engagement party and had spent the night. Sherry confronted John about it and he had admitted it was true. He had slept with Stephanie, but it was the last time, and he said it was for closure for Stephanie. 
It was at this point when Sherry told John that if they were to get married, he was not to be friends with Lazarus, and she was going to have to stop showing up at their home. John complied with Sherry, and their wedding proceeded. Stephanie and John had met in college. They lived on the same floor of their dorms. They had been friends for a long time. They often worked out and studied together. Stephanie was attractive, athletic, competitive, and intelligent. Stephanie and John kept a large group of friends, and they all had similar interests in sports and partying. Eventually, John and Stephanie became friends with benefits. They had an ongoing, open relationship for several years. They both dated other people, but would gravitate back to one another even after college. John had always considered their relationship to be very casual. Just kids fooling around was how he later described it to the courts. After college, Stephanie applied for the police academy, which had surprised her family. However, the training academy was close to where John was working as an engineer, and it allowed her to remain close to John. She had even thrown John a surprise 25th birthday party, and it was here that John told her he was seeing someone it was serious. Stephanie was devastated. She wrote to John's mother, I wish it didn't end the way it did, and I don't think I'll ever understand his decision. According to her journal, she wrote at the time, she was in a deep depression. She had truly believed that one day John would come to his senses and they would be together. It was after Sherry and John's engagement party that Stephanie begged John not to marry Sherry and confessed her love for him. John said he had told Stephanie he had wanted to be with Sherry, but the two did end up sleeping together that night. Stephanie had been determined that she could break up the happy couple. Even after John's wedding, she obsessed over John. She would write about him daily in her journal, convincing only herself that Sherry was the only thing in the way of her happiness. During the initial investigation, it was presumed that there had been a massive struggle. The police agreed that the struggle had lasted for over an hour and had moved from the upstairs staircase into the living room. Sherry had several bruises on her face and body suggesting that she had fought her attacker. She was very fit and was a tall woman. It would have been challenging for an assailant to subdue Sherry. The police speculated that Sherry had been hit over the head with a flower vase, giving the attacker enough time to get the gun out, wrap it in a blanket to muffle the sound, and deliver the fatal blows. Sherry had been shot three times, all shots were fatal. Note that this was consistent with how police trainees learned to take down enemies. Police theorized that two burglars had broken into the condo shortly after John left for work, and they were unhooking electronics in the living room when Sherry surprised them by coming out of the bedroom. They had a witness who described seeing two Latino men in the area, so the story formed that two illegal immigrants had killed Sherry. The only things that had been taken were Sherry's car that had been recovered two weeks later with no evidence, and Sherry and John's marriage license. Police were still confident in this theory because there had been several break-ins before the murder and one carried out in a similar manner two weeks after. A detective did note that a bite mark on Sherry's arm was more consistent with a female attacker, but no one supported his feelings, so he kind of chalked it up to that Males had been known to bite people as well. The lead detectives on the case were also older, highly overworked, and were covering multiple homicides and break-ins at this point, and without any good leads or suspects right off the bat, the case was stuffed into an evidence locker, and the detectives moved on to other cases. After Sherry's murder, friends and family were shocked that John wasn't more involved in the investigation to find Sherry's killer. John had quit his job and moved out of L.A. a few months after his wife had died. Sherry's father and police were convinced that he was holding back information, but John claims that he never held anything back, and he had told detectives to investigate his ex-girlfriend, but records show that he didn't point detectives in that direction until years later. Sherry's father had become her champion, 
continually pushing officers into her murder. In the weeks leading up to her death, Sherry had told her friends an unsettling story about an ex-girlfriend of John's, coming to her office and telling Sherry that, if I can't have John, no one can, and when this marriage doesn't work out, I'll be there to pick up the pieces. A co-worker told police that Sherry couldn't go anywhere without this ex-girlfriend casually popping up, often in uniform and armed. Sherry had been suspicious that Stephanie and her husband still had an ongoing intimate relationship, but John always denied it, accusing Sherry of being too jealous. John didn't support Sherry's feelings about being fearful of Stephanie, and Sherry had told friends she was thinking about breaking up with John because of it. Sherry had also told her father a few days before her murder that she was being followed by a person that she thought was a woman dressed as a man. The person had piercing eyes that she described as staring through you. When Sherry's father had been detailing this information to the lead detective, the detective told him he was watching too much TV. The lead detective has since retired, but when new detectives were going through the information on this case, they had noted that none of these statements had gone in the case file. The only leads noted in the case were ones that had gone in the burglary direction. <laughs> Sherry's father, John, and Sherry's co-workers and friends had all given statements, but law enforcement officers never followed up on them. It wasn't until two decades later. Current detectives give credit to Sherry's father, who never gave up on Sherry. He badgered law enforcement to open the case and to do DNA testing, even offering to pay for it himself. He was unsuccessful for many years, until, after many appeals, he was able to get the DNA evidence collected at the murder tested. It was at this point that there was no longer any denying justice. The evidence was too much to put off. The DNA had been taken from a small bite mark on Sherry's arm. Sherry's investigation was described as sloppy, negligent police work that was so poorly handled it looked to be a cover-up. That was the only explanation as to why Sherry's murder went unnoticed for two decades, despite having all of the evidence in the possession of the police. I'm going to have to split this into two videos due to length. However, the rest of the script is written. It just needs to be edited and put up. So for now, thank you for watching True Crime Mysteries. This is going to be part one of the Sherry Rasmussen case. Subscribe so you don't miss out on the conclusion to this cold case. So if you like the content, throw me a like and comment down below what you want me to do next. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you very soon. Be safe out there.